Welcome back, everyone. Next up, we have World Copper Limited. It trades on the OTCQX under the symbol WCUFF and on the TSXV under the symbol WCU and is a Canadian resource company focused on the exploration and development of its copper projects, Escalonis and Cristal in Chile and Zonia in Arizona. Please welcome its CEO, Nolan Peterson. Greetings, Nolan. How are you doing today? Good, Anna. Thank you for having me. We're excited to hear your presentation. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining me as well. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. First time presenting to this call, uh, group. Uh, so I'll just get right into it. Uh, this is World Copper. So we are a Vancouver-based junior mining company. Uh, we, a lot of junior mining companies come out of Canada. Uh, a lot of them are based in Vancouver, so we're no different there. We have assets in Chile, as mentioned, Escalonis and Cristal as well as an asset in the United States called Zonia in Arizona. Most of the conversation today will focus on Zonia and Escalonis, as these are our near-term uh, development stories. They are very advanced projects. They are copper projects, and they are copper oxide projects. Now, some of these uh, terms will become very clear as we go through it, but what I want to emphasize is that, you know, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of junior mining companies out there are resource companies that are very speculative that you're looking to invest in uh, potentially a property that you may find something there's no guarantee that you will for both zonia and escalonis these are advanced stage exploration properties they have proven resources by that i mean that they have geologists that have identified mineralogy and prepared a resource statement and then beyond that we have used that resource statement to prepare what's called a preliminary economic assessment. It's a very technical document. It's a third-party report prepared by third-party engineers that demonstrate the economic viability of the asset. So you can be investing in confidence in knowing that we're beyond uh, the stage of being a very speculative investment. I'll talk briefly about the team behind World Copper. Uh, myself, CEO and president, I'm an engineer by background. I'm a metallurgical engineer, so I've been working in the mining industry for almost 20 years. I've been, I was involved for over a decade in building and advancing major projects globally. Two major projects I was involved in, Kamloops New Afton Copper Gold, as well as the Rainy River Project in Northern Ontario, had capital costs almost approaching a billion dollars US. And I was at the senior levels of construction for that. Beyond that, I also have an MBA and a CFA designation. I've been working in corporate finance in the mining industry for the last six or seven years. So I bring almost two decades of experience on finance and the operation and technical side to the team. I have a very strong development focus. Our chairman and founder, Hank Van Alphen, is the executive and director and founder of a number of junior mining companies in Canada and has had a number of success stories, including a sale of one asset, uh, Corriente Resources for $860 million, uh, started at $10 million. He was also the chairman and founder of International Tower Hill, which also started at $10 million and was at one point worth over a billion dollars. On our team as well, we have an executive director in Chile named Marcelo Awad. He is the former CEO of Antofagasta Minerals, which is one of the largest copper companies in the world, certainly one of the top three copper companies in Chile. He grew that company from $4 billion to $20 billion while he was the CEO. This is the value proposition that we offer to our shareholders and potential shareholders. Three outstanding value drivers. We won't talk too much about Cristal. We'll focus mostly on Escalonis and Arizona and Escalonis. So reminder, Zonia is in Arizona and Escalonis is in Chile. Together, these two projects have over 4 billion pounds of copper oxide in the ground. So that is an indication of the potential economic value. It's important to understand that copper oxides, as opposed to copper sulfides, which is another way that copper is produced, are much lower initial capital. We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars to build a mine, as opposed to billions of dollars. The operating costs are lower, the returns are higher, the profitability is better, and they are cleaner and greener to operate as well, which is becoming more and more important as our economies are looking to uh, diversify and electrify 
away from uh, polluting uh, production methods. Together, these two projects have a demonstrated economic value at a PEA stage of $2.3 billion in after-tax NPV, net present value, at $4 copper. And yet we are trading at a $25 million U.S. market cap at this point in time. That's almost a 99% discount to NPV. Now, for those of you who don't follow the mining space, you may think, okay, there's probably hundreds of other companies that have these numbers out there. This is absolutely not the case. Any typical company should be looking at a 70% discount to NPV, which would put us at about a $600 million market cap. That is more typical. Uh, this is very unusual to have this type of valuation gap, and most companies are lucky to have one asset like Azonia or Escalonis, let alone two, which is what we have put together. So as well, I want to point out this slide for those who are uh, agnostic to the industry or don't invest in mining a lot. Maybe they're turned off by the risk profile. They think there's a lot of pump and dump schemes out there, which is absolutely not what we are. I want to draw your attention here to the junior co mining company lifecycle. It's also called the Lassonde curve. You can look it up. In the left area here, we have the high potential mines, our projects. 95% or so of the companies that you will hear about uh, out of Canada or the United States that are called juniors operate in this area. The risk level is very high, but the opportunity for speculation is very high as well. And there is a speculation return that can be reaped and rewarded. But inevitably, these projects and companies drop in value as the discovery is never as good as people think it will be or it needs to be to be a viable project. And ent a company enters what is unfortunately called for the company or the project the orphan period, but I call it the opportunity period for investors. This is the last opportunity for investors to get in on a project that is lower risk but still has exceptional value proposition because you're sitting on an asset that you know already exists. It's already been demonstrated to be proven with drilling. That's where we are with both of our assets. We're looking right now to expand our investor base and bring on institutional investors that will allow us to get to full value. So we operate in copper. Why is copper that important? You know, We see commodity, copper is a global commodity. It's involved in the conduction of electricity. 75% of copper demand comes from the conduction of electricity. You've probably heard a lot about electrification, decarbonization. As we move towards that, copper is becoming even more important. But simultaneously, we don't see copper in our daily lives. So it's a price and its effect uh, on the economy is subdued because we don't see it. We go to the gas station, we see the price of, of oil, but we don't see the price of copper. And that is leading us as an as a economy and society towards a copper supply and demand deficit, a cliff that is starting to form and will be formed by 2025. There's a clear deficit of demand and supply that will form. This is absolutely guaranteed. 99% certainty it will happen. Analysts such as Goldman Sachs are forecasting it, as well as many other analysts in the industry, not just myself. And you'll also notice it's highly unusual, but demand is steadily increasing while supply drops. Usually, supply struggles to keep up with demand, but still increases. This is an unusual situation where it's actually going to start to form a gap where supply is dropping. Demand is expected to increase, and you have Goldman Sachs and others forecasting a $6.80 per pound copper price by 2025, which is actually double what it is today. Uh, that doesn't mean that stocks will double. It actually means that the, the stocks will probably go up even higher for those that are investing in the copper industry. For juniors such as ourselves who have not realized our full value, that is the upside that we are looking to uh, uh, tap into. Uh, this is just talking about the uses of copper. So copper is a uh, demand side. Copper is expected to grow. Uh, its use is expected to grow from the use in solar and wind power, as well as electric vehicles. For those who aren't aware, may, they may be supply, surprised to learn that an electric vehicle uses four times as much copper 
as a normal internal combustion engine vehicle. So that's just one stat. I don't think the average person is aware that copper is becoming more and more important. And yet again, as I'll point out, supply is dropping. So let's talk about our Zonia project. Zonia is in Arizona, and Arizona is one of the premier mining jurisdictions globally for copper. It certainly is premier in the United States. 71% of US copper supply is produced in Arizona. Major mining companies, companies operate 10 copper mines in, uh, in, the, in the state, and it's one of the top five most attractive mining jurisdictions globally. Our project, Zonia, is 120 miles northwest of Phoenix. It's in an area where there's a number of mines already existing. Itself was a mine that was in operations in the 60s and 70s that shut down due to low copper prices. But you can see it's already been pre-stripped. So that means that it keeps the strip ratio low, which means the waste to ore ratio low. Uh, the leach pad from former production a mine site and buildings that are in place right now. The property itself, you can see in the southwest corner of this claims map, has 50,000 meters of drilling, which is a lot of drilling uh, for a project of this size. That means that it's a well understood deposit and has produced a very good resource statement that we have prepared a preliminary, that a, a preliminary economic assessment was carried out on. In addition to the resource that's already in place and has demonstrated economic value to the Northeast, we have a target that could potentially expand this resource by two to three times. So very good upside potential if that interests you. Now, four years ago, a preliminary economic assessment was carried out. We're in the process of updating this, but it is an early indication about the economic potential. Initial capital was $200 million in the bottom right there. After tax NPV was $200 million at $3 copper price. If we're looking at a $4 or $5 copper price, you can see the after tax NPV goes up even higher, $450 million after tax NPV at $4 and $150 million after tax first year free cash flow. Again, for an initial capital investment of only about 200 million itself. This is a very strong project, very advanceable, and we are pushing this project to development. And the silver bullet for this project is that the entirety of it sits on what's called private patented land. Now in mining, permitting is of, uh, uh, many times the, the limiter to how quickly you can bring a mine to production. For this asset, because we sit on private patented land, we can move it forward very aggressively and have an operations in three to four years. Now, for those who don't invest in mining, that may seem like a long period of time, but it's actually very, very short in the industry where it can take seven to 10 years to develop a mine globally uh, that is of any stature like the Zonia project. The goal for uh, Zonia will be to reap the cash flow from this and then put it towards our Chilean asset, Escalonis, which we'll talk about now. So for those who aren't aware, Chile, you know, is in South America, it's a small country, uh, but actually is very, very important to global copper supplies. They, it is the largest copper producing country in the world. O almost 30% of global copper comes from Chile. It's a stable mining friendly, friendly jurisdiction and eight of the 10 largest copper companies operate mines in Chile. I think seven of the 10 largest copper mines themselves are in Chile. Our asset, Escalonis, is in the Santiago region of Chile, so it's in near the capital, so it's not out in the middle of nowhere. It's an area of good infrastructure. There's power, water, and road readily, uh, road access readily available to the site. It's 35 kilometers east of a project called El Teniente. El Teniente is the largest underground copper mine in the entire world. It's owned by Codelco, which is the largest copper company in the world. Escalonis itself is, has 25,000 meters of drilling. So again, fairly well understood uh, on the property. It is also an oxide project, just like Zonia, and that gives it its low capital profile, low operating costs, high returns, and high profitability. In addition to the existing drilled resource, we have just completed a drill program of this target to the south called the Mancha Almeria. We expect drill results for that to be released in the next month or so that will allow us to prove at a conceptual level 
that we can expand this resource potentially up to 50% or 75% or even maybe even double this resource in size, make it an even more attractive target. A key thing to point out that this is actually the largest copper oxide project in development in Chile right now. Uh, and Chile, to be the largest copper anything in Chile, you have to be fairly substantial, which is exactly what we are. Uh, and you can see that on this chart. The economics for Escalonis are very strong. We put out a PEA uh, in February of this year, post-tax NPV of $1.5 billion, a 46.2% internal rate of return, and a 2.2 year payback at a 360 copper price for an initial capital of only 438.4 million. Now again, for those who don't deal in the mining space, very often you may look at these numbers and say, okay, there must be a dozen other projects out there with economics like this. Absolutely not the case. These are truly exceptional economic numbers. You can see that here, or you can see that when you look at how our market cap and price stand up against our NPV, against other projects that are at the same stage of development, PEA, in the same general jurisdiction, Chile and Argentina. And also these companies have no cash flows, uh, no like revenues or cash flows from operating mines. We are all juniors that are working to develop our asset. And you can see that we are at a 98% discount against Escalonis's asset value. And a more typical discount is 75% to 90%. That would be, if we were at a 90%, that would be a 5X return from your investment today if you were to invest in World Copper. And again, I want to point out how low our initial capital is, 438 million. You can see that on bottom left area there of the of the table of the chart, compared to the billions it would cost to build the, the three projects in the middle. The one on the left, Merimaca, is another oxide project like ours. And you can see on the right there at the bottom, the NPVs of these projects we are in the billion dollar range. Some of these other projects are also in the billion dollar range, but they cost five to 10 times more to build than Escalonis does. Merimaca, that other copper oxide project, you can see in the middle on the right, their NPV at the bottom is 757 million. Our project is twice the NPV of Merimaca. They are eight times our market cap and 17 times our P to NAV ratio. This is the investment thesis for those who are looking for a value opportunity for a company that has established assets and a clear runway of growth to, to, as we close this gap. Uh, leave it uh, there uh, as I'm running a bit on time. I do want to leave some time for questions, but basically, uh, you know, commodities are cyclical. Copper, we believe, and the market believes, is entering a super cycle despite the weakness in the market. And the volatility we're seeing in the near term, the long term potential for copper and other commodities is very, very good. And so we want to be at the forefront of that. And I do uh, open the up, open uh, for questions now. Great job, Nolan. OK, let's get into our questions. Starting with Brittany Farrell, the world copper story sounds interesting, but what really separates it from the many other resource companies out there with similar stories? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of junior mining companies. Uh, there's 1,700, I believe, that trade on the TSX Venture. How do you sift through them all? Do they all have the same story? You know, they all seem to have the greatest grades or the greatest deposit. I'm an engineer. I would encourage people to look at the fundamental value and assets that the company is sitting on. And you'll see quite quickly that World Copper stands out compared to many others that are on our same market cap. Uh, and that is the difference. That is truly what is different about us. We've put this company together in a short period of time. We have an experienced team. We're not at the, I'm the CEO is not a geologist. I'm not a geologist because we're beyond that. We are really about getting value for the shareholders and developing the assets and not hoping that we find something. So that's what sets us apart. And I think that uh, if you do your due diligence, you'll see that that, that is the difference. Aiden Guerrero says, you've talked about how world copper is undervalued, but what do you think is the appropriate value for your company today? Yeah, so in a typical market, you're looking, as I mentioned, uh, alluded to a little bit earlier, 
at a PEA stage, so preliminary economic assessment stage, you're looking at a discounted PEA of about 70%. So you should be getting anywhere from 20 to 30% of your PEA value. So if we are sitting at an after-tax PEA value of one, uh, one billion, uh, sorry, $1.5 billion, at a 30%, we should be at about $450 million US. We're at a $25 million US market cap right now. So there's your multiples, there's the multiple potential. And as I show you here, these are other projects that are seeing valuations. They're low right now, but you know you can see 75%. So there's that 30% uh, valuation for Maramaka. Some are in the 15% range. Even at that, we would be looking at a five or 10X today. So yeah, that's where I think we should be uh, and we will be very soon. Thank you for that. Lee Gilmore wants you to talk about your proven reserves. What do you anticipate your production cost will be versus what you will sell the asset for? Yeah, so let's go to one of these slides. Let's go to the Zonia slide in Arizona. The operating costs for this project is $1.46 per pound of copper. That in the copper industry is very low. It comes from being an oxide project. So you don't have a large amount of infrastructure, large operating costs that come with the other type of technology, which is sulfide project. And I say technology, I don't want to give anyone the wrong impression that we're sitting on a unproven technology. Oxide and sulfide processing technologies are both decades old, very well understood. It's just a different type of material. So yeah, we're at $1.50 for Zonia. That means that in a $4 copper price environment, every pound of copper I pull out, 50 million pounds of copper a year, I'm making $2.50 per pound off of that. So over $100 million in free cash. Uh, and then if I look at Escalonis, the operating costs are $1.20 per pound C1. So you're looking at, again, uh, two, 2 or $3 a pound profit. And we're mining at 115 million pounds of copper a year. So there's your cash flow of three or four dollars, three to four hundred million dollars a year. Also, key to point out if you're sitting on two assets with four billion pounds of copper oxide in the ground at a four dollar copper price, that's uh, what uh, 16 billion dollars worth of uh, revenue sitting in the ground that we're sitting on. Demonstrated. Wow. Uh, Janessa Ford says, you mentioned three projects. Are they all 100% rolled up into this company? Or does World Copper have any joint ventures that are not 100% vested in the public company? Yeah, so at this point in time, we don't have any joint ventures. Crystal is our other project. It's a little bit of a higher, uh, uh, higher risk, I guess. It's a blue sky economic potential. We really like it. It's just about targeting it and drilling it at the right moment in time. Uh, for a short presentation like this, I don't uh, like to talk about, I don't have time usually to talk about it very often, but certainly if anyone wants a follow up, happy to discuss uh, at any time uh, in detail about all three projects and Crystal. Great. Aiden Rubio says, Zona property, how much do you have to invest in this property and how do you plan to raise the funds? Yeah, so uh, we have to invest probably about 10, five to $10 million to bring it to a feasibility study stage. At that stage, you get what's called a bankable feasibility study. You can start going for financing and start talking to uh, groups that are interested in debt or pre-sales uh, of the asset, uh, or sorry, of the copper that's in production. So that would be the means that we would raise the funding to actually build the Zonia project. In before that, we do have to raise the money to advance it. It's very typical in the mining space that companies, juniors are always looking for money to advance it. Kind of, we're kind of like the juniors or like the tech industry. You know, we're pre-revenue, we're startups. Uh, but uh, yeah, so their options are liquidity through equity. Uh, also, we sold a royalty, a very small royalty on Zonia, a 1% royalty gross revenue at about 60% of its NPV value. So that's a very good uh, uh, return monetizing that. That'll bring in about $5 million over the next year and a half that will fund uh, Zonia development. So when you have two assets that are at that stage of development, 
uh, you have those opportunities to make deals like that. And we are in active discussions on both assets at, uh, right now to do similar deals like that or to bring on partners that will help to fund the assets as we advance them. Fantastic. Jim Cantrell says, you mentioned a four-year timeline earlier. Can you go over some of the major milestones over that time that you need to hit? Yeah, so absolutely. For Zonia, again, we want to put this project into operations in four years. That starts with a drilling and PEA update this year, uh, uh, or at least certainly a PEA update. We don't need to do drilling, although if the market supports that, we'll certainly do it. Feasibility study starting next year that will lead into permitting and construction starting in 2024. And by permitting, I mean receipt of major permits, which will start the permitting process earlier. And then a year, about a year and a half to construct, and then we'll be producing copper by 2025. A very fast track approach, very achievable uh, in due to the fact that we sit on private patented land. Fantastic. Dave Meadows says, uh, I get it that risk is mitigated with the current valuation, but what are some other calculated risks? What could go wrong? Good yeah, that's always a good question. Um, you, I would say that the biggest risk, uh, just to address that point again, for any junior mining company is actually finding a resource, right? Because there's no certainty that you'll actually find something. You have to spend millions of dollars to drill it. So that risk is behind us. What exists going forward is normal risk that every project faces, even ones that are held by major large scale companies, which is permitting risk. Will you be able to get the permits in a timely manner? Community risk, will the community support, uh, support your development activities? Can you come to agreements? Financing risk, of course, you know, you have to find the money to build the projects. Every project that gets to our stage has those risks. So for us, nothing really stands out as a as a unusual risk because we're in great jurisdictions, the United States and Chile, very established mining jurisdictions, very supportive industries for mining. Uh, otherwise, we just have to put the teams in place that will work through the permitting processes, work through building up uh, support in the uh, local communities and developing our assets. And great. Of course, no, find, find financing. Thank you. And that too, yes. Uh, Kyle M wants to know, are there any majors producing around you? And if so, have you reached out to any for a joint venture or are you going to do this alone? Yeah, no, there's lots of majors near us. As I mentioned, El Teniente is the, uh, owned by Cadelco. They're the largest copper, comp oh, copper company in the world, state-owned Chilean company. Uh, we've certainly reached out to a number of them. Uh, they've They've signed NDAs with us. I have one of the largest mining companies in the world uh, actually at our Escalona site this week doing a 10-day due diligence of the asset. They really like Escalona. This is the start of how these uh, types of investments start, either an acquisition of the asset or development or joint venture. So yes, definitely uh, those are always ongoing uh, and those discussions have started. Great. <clears throat> Bob Fuller wants to know um, a little bit more about the electric cars. Uh, based yep. on that, are there any government grants you may be entitled to with the recent bill that was just signed? He noticed electric car related infrastructure stock spiked. Yeah, we are. Uh, so, yeah, obviously consumers see the things that they're ex exposed to the most, which is electric cars or smartphones or whatever. The things that produce into that don't always get the same fanfare. Uh, immediately. So once people realize electric cars, hey, this is a great investment. Why don't I go up the supply chain to the the, the companies that are producing the resources that go into them? That's where we'll, we'll start to benefit. We're actually taking a good look at uh, what was in the latest bill because we are seeing a lot of talk about supporting more, in certainly in the United States, more onshoring of strategic critical elements like copper. Uh, bringing that on, uh, bringing that domestic, uh, creating American jobs. That's a message that's really resonating. And I think that states and the federal government are going to start to support those types of projects going forward, whether it be through tax advantages or, you know, grants or subsidies. Uh, so, yeah, that is definitely going to be on our agenda to explore as we develop. And we certainly think that, that more of those are going to come uh, to, to pass soon. Are any of your products a hybrid? Jaden Chen wants to know, or are you solely copper-based? 
We are, all of our projects have other elements, but right now, because we're an oxide project, the technology only allows for the extraction of copper in an economic manner. Uh, so if we were to do sulfide processing, uh, we would get gold or silver or molybdenum, but it would cost a lot, lot more as I demonstrated. So yeah, we're focused primarily on copper, but at a later stage or in a different hands, another company may be interested in getting those elements which do exist through a different processing technique. Um, but we like the economics for oxides and they are cleaner and greener and easier to permit. Uh, so we're really focusing on those right now. Last question on our end, Caroline Steele wants to know if you can give us a timeline as far as progress to production on each property and are they all about four years out? Uh, yeah, so Zonia is about four years out. Escalonis is larger and is a little bit further behind than Zonia, but that's fine. Building two large projects like this at the same time is uh, not something that a junior like us would be capable of. Uh, but it does create a nice synergy and a nice development path that's clear to see uh, that we will get Zonia into operations and then two or three years after that, Escalonis will come online. And that's a more natural progression when we have the cash flow from Zonia to fund the slightly more expensive Escalonis project. So yeah, that's uh, kind of the development path that's ahead of us for both projects. And I do want to emphasize and go back and say again, many other companies are really only focused on the next six months or a year because if they don't find anything, they have to go back to the drawing board. I already know what we can and should be doing. We have the experience and we've done it before and we're gonna be doing it again. Fantastic presentation, Nolan. Thank you for answering all these questions so thoroughly. We would love to have you back with your updates. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Anna. Thank you everyone else. Have a great day. Awesome. Okay, everyone, stay with us. We've got another exciting company coming up real soon. We'll, we'll see you soon. Stay with us. We'll be right back.